This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform where entrepreneurs can easily create and customize their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Small, and today we're talking about Stanley Kubrick the cinematic genius. And as with all the videos here at Biographics, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That writing team member today being James CJ. Go follow them at the social media links below if you are so inclined. Mine are also down there. Um, just Google Carl Smallwood, first name with a K, second name with a small and then a wood. Yep, I know how it sounds. Let's move past it. Also, just for fun, because I run a trivia channel on the side called Fact Fiend, when we get to movies of Kubrick's that I have some trivia about, I'll be dropping that, you know, for fun. Also, because who else am I going to tell it to? No, none of my friends want to talk about Kubrick movies. And one last thing, also, I may accidentally mispronounce Kubrick's name as Kubrick, and that's because I've pronounced it that way for years after having just read it in textbooks and... Um, uh, in a film class before I ever heard anyone pronounce it out loud. So I do apologize for that, but with all that out of the way, let's get to it. Throughout its history, Hollywood has produced countless legends in film, and one filmmaker took the industry and art form by storm like no other could during the 20th century. That man was Stanley Kubrick, known for his meticulous attention to detail, artistic vision, innovative cinematography, and ongoing themes of the breakdown of the human spirit. Kubrick was what many filmmakers hoped to become. Stanley Kubrick found a passion for photography and film from a very young age, transforming it into a desire to be a filmmaker, and in turn became one of the greatest filmmakers of the entire 20th century. Century. A career filled with extreme highs and quite a few lows and unrealized passion projects. This is the remarkable story of Stanley Kubrick. Born into a relatively wealthy Jewish family living in the Bronx, New York City, Stanley Kubrick was born on June 26, 1928, to parents Jacques and Gertrude Kubrick. Stanley was six when his sister Barbara was born on May 21st, 1934. And despite having an above average IQ, Stanley was fairly abysmal as a student pretty much his entire learning career. While he showcased his intelligence in things that interested him, school just wasn't one of those things. When he was 13, his father bought him his first camera, setting off a fast fascination in Stanley and he fell in love with that camera and still photography in general. During Kubrick's high school years, not much changed regarding his academic prowess. He remained a fairly mediocre student despite his obvious intelligence, often cutting school to go to the cinema to watch double features, with his only real effort being put towards photography club. Upon graduation in 1945, Kubrick faced the harsh reality that he'd most likely not attend college. Every burned out, gifted kid can relate. This wasn't just because of his poor grades, but also the influx of soldiers returning home from the war who took preference in college admissions. So what to do now. After high school, Kubrick began working at Lux magazine as a staff photographer, and from ages 17 to 21, Kubrick developed his photographic skills through years of trial and error, experimentation, learning things like composition, lenses, style, exposure, and more. And this is going to be really embarrassing because this is filmed on a very basic prosumer model camera, and I know that my camera work isn't the best, and this is about Kubrick, so I'd feel remiss if I didn't mention there is a quite adorable interview with Stanley Kubrick, one of the few he ever gave willingly, um, which is shot on a handheld, early prosumer-grade camera that he is fascinated with. Like, he's talking, like, obviously it's in terrible quality, but Kubrick is... He's talking to the interviewer, and in typical Kubrick fashion, after he gives his answer, says, let's run that back again. And then later in the interview, he's talking to the cameraman about the camera he's holding in his hand, and he's fascinated by the idea that just you can move a camera around in your hand. So I would like to think that Kubrick would be happy with the idea that photographic technology has improved to a point that any old person on the internet can just get their hands on one and just engage their creative passion. I hope. Anyway, getting back to Kubrick during his time at the magazine, his interest in the movies deepened, and outside of work, Kubrick's personal life was also going pretty well. On May 28, 1948, he married his high school sweetheart, Toba Metz, and they moved together into a tiny apartment in Greenwich Village. Again, 
every creative um, uh, like a gifted burnout kid out there can relate to moving to that tiny one bed apartment hoping to make it big. Kubrick became known as a storyteller through his pictures during his tenure. There were no limitations to what he'd cover as a staff photographer, having taken on jobs like covering the Ringling Bros and Barn and Bailey Circus, doing a travel piece in Portugal, covering boxing matches and photographing famous jazz musicians, just to name a few of the things that he did. And despite the diversity of all these projects, it still didn't satisfy Kubrick creatively. So in the 1950s, he decided to take a risk it was time for Stanley Kubrick to make a short film. Kubrick's desire to make a short film was hampered by one glaring issue that really hampers most creatives. Funding. Kubrick just didn't have a lot of money lying around, so he took his $1,500 in savings and decided to make his first film with his high school friend, Alexander Singer, on a shoestring budget as best that he could. The film would be a documentary on a guy called Walter Cartier, a boxer he'd covered in 1949, so Kubrick had a connection there. Kubrick titled the film Day of the Fight, and together the pair managed to convince some other people to lend their talents to the project for a price. For example, they got a student from Juilliard to do the score with a hired orchestra and a CBS newsman called Douglas Edwards to do the narration. Again, not for free, but for cheap, which was uh, the next best thing. In total, the film's budget was some $4,000, which comprised of quite literally almost every penny Kubrick had to his name, with the rest of the balance being paid by his father, Jacques, as an investment on the future of his career. Ultimately, the film did make its money back when they sold the rights to RKO. After it opened on April 26, 1951, as part of a short film series, the film career of director Stanley Kubrick had officially begun. So after Day of the Fight, RKO gave Kubrick a $1,500 advance on his next short film, and his second short, Flying Padre, would go on to break even following its March 1951 release. The moderate success of these shorts was enough to convince Kubrick to leave Look Magazine and pursue a career in filmmaking full-time. During this in-between stage of Kubrick's transition from shorts to features, he held on to a script written by one of his old high school friends called The Trap. Stanley had managed to get a $9,000 investment from his uncle for an executive producer's credit, which was a small price to pay. Having not grown into his filmmaking boots just yet, Kubrick made several disastrous and almost fatal decisions when filming The Trap in 1952, which would later become known as Fear and Desire. One nearly fatal choice was creating fog by having a nearby crop duster spray insecticide upon the location. His worst decision by far, though, was choosing to save time by filming without sound, which ended up costing the movie an additional $50,000 to rectify in post. Fortunately for Kubrick, a producer called Richard de Rochemont was impressed by his work and bailed him out, funding all the sound production. Released on March 31st, 1953, Fear Desire did not fare well financially, but did receive several decent reviews. Kubrick would later describe the film as, and I quote, a bumbling amateur film exercise, and as a result of its financial failure, Kubrick signed on for another short in 1953 titled The Seafarers for the Seafarers Log. It was Kubrick's first film shot in colour after learning valuable lessons from fear and desire. Like, you know, not poisoning your actors and filming with sound. Moving on! Following Fear and Desires, Kubrick struggled to find work. He also struggled to find time for his wife because he started having an affair with a dancer called Ruth Sabotka while planning for his next film. The affair took a turn when Kubrick moved in with Sabotka, causing Stanley to end his marriage that same year and marry Ruth in 1955. Around this time, Kubrick was working on his next feature with Fear and Desire writer Howard O. Sackler. The film was initially titled Kiss Me, Kill Me before simply becoming the killer's kiss. Kubrick had a harder time getting the production off the ground. Thankfully, a Bronx pharmacist named Morris Boussel came to Stanley's rescue, providing the principal budget of $40,000 in exchange for a shared producer's credit. Never underestimate the ego of a rich person. The movie began production in 1954 in New York City, and Kubrick didn't really have permission to film on the streets of New York, so he employed guerrilla filmmaking techniques. And for anyone unfamiliar with guerrilla filmmaking, they are characterized by the use of skeleton crews, limited props, and the use of available locations, resources, and equipment while operating on a micro budget. Another filmmaker well known for starting their career using guerrilla filmmaking techniques is James Cameron. And the movie that's perhaps most famous for employing these techniques is the first Terminator movie. And a bunch of that stuff was filmed just like without permits and for very little money. And one of my favorite examples being the scene in which the Terminator just walks over to a car and punches through the window. To achieve that effect, they drove Arnold Schwarzenegger in full Terminator like get up to 
a like a street that they knew a few friends who lived on um, that they knew was quite quiet and no one would complain um, and told Arnold Schwarzenegger to walk over to a nearby park car and punch through the window as they filmed him. And when later asked if they used like prop glass for the window, because, you know, punching through glass is quite dangerous, James Cameron went, no, we just figured a guy of Arnold Schwarzenegger's build would be able to punch through a regular window without issue. And he did. Uh, likewise, the, I think the final shot of the entire film, where it's just um, uh, Sarah Connor walking down the road, that was like one of the final shots they filmed, and they very nearly got pulled over and told off by the police because they didn't have a permit, and James Cameron managed to convince the police officer that it was for a student film. So imagine um, uh, that police officer's um, uh, surprise when a few months later, that student film was a blockbuster in the cinemas. Anyway, getting back to Kubrick. As one can imagine, this made the process of making the movie far more difficult, but in the end, they did succeed, and Kubrick sold Killer's Kiss for $75,000 to United Artists. Despite a rocky start, things were about to change for the director. Kubrick's biggest issue in his early career was financing and never really having a producer. This meant that Stanley was handling pretty much every aspect of making a movie. This changed when Alex Singer introduced Kubrick to James B. Harris, who'd recently sold a film distribution company and wanted to become a producer. So, in 1955, they formed Harris Kubrick Picture Corporation. The duo immediately set about purchasing the rights to a story called Clean Break by a guy called Lionel White for about $10,000. United Artists initially agreed to partially fund the movie that they'd now titled The Killer if they got a big name attached, and they did manage to secure a guy called Sterling Haid for about $40,000, but United Artists didn't deem him to be a big enough name. Like, be honest, you had to Google who he was if you even knew who he was at all. So they only put $200,000 towards production. Harris added an additional $80,000 to complete the financing, and then Kubrick, Harris, and Singer moved to LA for filming. The Killing was released on May 19, 1956, and was... A financial failure. This was largely because United Artists failed to secure a proper release date and barely marketed the film. The film opened a door for Harris Kubrick to MGM though, who did give Kubrick and Harris $75,000 to write, direct and produce a film for them, which Kubrick and Harris settled on being Paths of Glory. Ultimately this didn't really work out because MGM didn't want to make that particular movie as they'd already done an anti-war film and as we all know, there's one thing Hollywood hates doing, it's making the same movie over and over and over again. The pair were eventually fired when they continued working on it secretly while working on a project based on MGM properties. <sighs> Those guerrilla filmmaking techniques never leave you, eh, Kubrick? So they went back to United Artists, but this time it was different. They had a star attached to their picture who had some real star power, Kirk Douglas, and he threatened to walk away from their guaranteed successful project to get the film greenlit for a proper budget of $900,000, and it worked. They filmed in January 1957 in Munich, Germany, where Stanley would meet his third and final wife, Christiane Suzanne Harlan, who played a minor role in the film. Kubrick's marriage to Ruth had fallen apart before filming commenced, and they officially divorced in 1957, and in 1958, Kubrick and Christiane Harlan married. Paths of Glory opened in December of 1957, and the film was critically successful, but somewhat controversial, especially in Europe for its portrayal of the French army. Financially, on the other hand, the movie broke even, which made getting another movie funded relatively challenging, because at this point, Kubrick hadn't really managed to turn any significant profits with any of his films, despite the decent reviews. So Kubrick wouldn't find his next film. His next film would find him. So I'm sure whatever I was just talking about was very interesting, but it's time for an ad read. Give me my hand here. Brad and Nisha, tell me more about Squarespace. Well, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that you can use to create yourself a beautiful website. And uh, you can use it to blog, engage with the audience, or you can sell products, content, or time. Well, let's pretend, though, for a moment that I am an idiot. Could I use Squarespace? I mean, you specifically, maybe not. I know how large a calibre of idiot you are. But people who are slightly less calibre of idiot, potentially, yes. There we go. That's always good to hear, that the product is made for people like myself. Or maybe people who are slightly smarter and more computer literate than myself. Squarespace has a system built into it called the Fluid Engine. Which sounds amazing. The Fluid Engine allows you to customise any aspect of your website just by dragging and dropping elements around and then changing the details. So you drag and you drop. See, look, it's not just a prop. It serves its purpose. You drag and then you drop. Well, that, that means it is a prop. Oh yeah, I told you I'm an idiot. <laughs> As I said, if you'd like to build a website to sell anything, you can sell products, content, 
or you can sell time. And if anyone out there is wondering, well, how do you sell your time? Well, if you happen to have a particular set of skills like rotating anteaters, you can sell a one-off course or access to a series of courses to teach people how to do that. Yeah, perfect, just 360 on your anteater. Squarespace also comes with a built-in analytics page that you can use to, I guess, see how well your anteater flipping course is doing. Yes, because what does I always say, you guys? Analytics are king! So thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial when you're ready to launch. Go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics to save 10% on your first purchase of a website slash domain. Use the code biographics. And as is tradition, would you guys like to hear a bonus fun fact about Napoleon Bonaparte? Yay! Napoleon Bonaparte was coronated wearing an 80 pound pimp cape that took four stout men to help him carry. And fun fact, on the morning of his coronation, Napoleon ordered cannons across Paris be set off at the crack of dawn just to wake everybody up to let them know what was about to happen. While Lolita was only released in 1962, Kubrick and Harris acquired the rights for $150,000 in 1958 after initially reading the book by Vladimir Nabokov. They stopped working on the project when Kirk Douglas, yes, you know, the Kirk Douglas from before, called Kubrick on February 13th, 1959, asking him to direct a movie the following Monday. Kubrick had just a single week to get up to speed on his next project, the epic Spartacus. For Kubrick, Spartacus was his first big budget production with a budget of about $6 million. Douglas had fired the previous director and turned to Kubrick to direct the movie instead. This was even though it wasn't initially his idea and at first even denounced the very idea of Kubrick directing the movie at all due to Kubrick not being the type of director to just let a big name actor call the shots. Regardless, Kubrick did agree, allowing him to make his first feature length film in colour and his first epic. Spartacus was by no means an easy movie to make for many reasons, some of which we'll detail now. First of all, Kubrick and Douglas constantly butted heads. Stanley's changes to the story sometimes cut Douglas's dialogue, which infuriated the actor. Additionally, Kubrick lacked the kind of control he craved on a film set and would later become famous for. And then there were other general issues like illnesses and injuries, among others, and despite all these issues, the film made it through its 167 days of filming and its months of post-production before being released on October 1960, becoming a massive success and one that put Kubrick on the map. Spartacus was nominated for some six Academy Awards at the 1961 Oscars, predominantly in technical and design categories, ultimately winning four awards. During the entire production of Spartacus, Kubrick became a father to two daughters, which was a great time for Kubrick. He was a happily married man, a father, and established as a big name in Hollywood. With the success of Spartacus, Kubrick was able to take more risk, and his next film was exactly that. Risky. With more sway in Hollywood, Kubrick and Harris decided to take another crack at Lolita, and the original author could have worded that better, because that's a sound clip I'm not sure I'm happy about existing out there, but there we go. After Warner Bros wouldn't give Kubrick autonomy over making the movie, he instead went to associated artists who agreed not to touch a single frame in the movie. Again, another feature of Kubrick's career, always insisting upon final cut privilege. They took the production to England and used tax breaks, and for 88 days they filmed Lolita, costing some $2 million. And the final product was admittedly edited ever so slightly to comply with some censoring body suggestions, with whom Kubrick remained in touch throughout production, but Ultimately, the film was Kubrick's vision. When Lolita was initially released on June 13th, 1962, it received, shall we say, mixed reviews. But on its first run, it did make $3.7 million, and it would take decades for Lolita to garner the critical success and acceptance it now enjoys. Regardless, it does remain a fairly controversial film due to its subject matter, so likewise with the original novel. And if anyone out there is wondering, well, what's the deal with Lolita? Google it. We'll wait. Use safe search or incognito mode. So you, you scroll down, you've read the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page on it. All on the same page? Yeah, good. Let's move on. Following the film's end, Kubrick and Harris parted ways, with Harris wanting to direct and the pair having outgrown their partnership, which was fine by Kubrick. The basis for Kubrick's next film began when he contemplated thermonuclear war during the Cold War era, which rightfully terrified him. However, the more he researched the subject, the more he realised that the whole situation was absurd and mostly panic. Kubrick bought the rights to Red Alert by Peter George and with the writers Terry Southern. They created a satirical black comedy called Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. So here's some trivia. This is the first movie on the list I know some uh, 
pretty interesting trivia about, if I do say so myself. The first is that uh, the film is famously in black and white, yes, and for one of the most iconic shots in the film, Kubrick just did a very Kubrickian thing where uh, he very specifically instructed the set dressers to make the table that all the world leaders are talking on be covered in green baize, similar to a poker table. Because in his head, the, I the idea was it looks like the world leaders are playing like you know, a game with humanity's future. And when it was pointed out to Kubrick that the film would be in black and white and that it wouldn't matter what colour the table was because no one at home would see it, Kubrick responded, the actors will know. Kubrick reunited with Lolita star Peter Sellers, who played multiple roles in Doctor Strangelove, which finished filming in April 1963 after 15 weeks of production. After eight months of edits, it was released on January 30th, 1964. And Doctor Strangelove ultimately made $5 million against its $2 million budget and earned Kubrick his first Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Director and Adapted Screenplay, where it ultimately walked home empty-handed. Kubrick was on a roll, but just not critically, it would seem. In February 1964, not long after Doctor Strange was released, Kubrick began itching to make a sci-fi movie that was connected to Arthur C. Clarke. Together, they crafted a screenplay for 2001 A Space Odyssey between May and December of that same year. And the movie began production in New York in 1965 before moving to MGM North London Studios in June of that same year. Throughout the creation of 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stanley worked with NASA and companies responsible for making the spacecraft used during the Apollo missions to ensure the film was as accurate as possible. Another whole mark of his career. I guess I have to mention the joke. The old joke is that the moon landings were faked and they got Stanley Kubrick in to direct them, but he was such a stickler for authenticity that he made them film it on location. Da -da. Filming officially began on 2001 A Space Odyssey on December 29th, 1965, and the film wouldn't officially be finished until the end of 1967, when the special effects team wrapped up their work on the movie. While Doctor Strange Love was a dialogue-heavy film, 2001 A Space Odyssey was the complete opposite. Initially, that wasn't by design, but as a result of Kubrick's constant cutting of lines of dialogue throughout filming and editing. Just, he created the film and the edit, basically. When the film opened on April 3rd, 1968, audiences and critics didn't really understand understand what they were watching, but thanks to word of mouth, the film was a hit, grossing $31 million by 1972. Once again, Kubrick received numerous Academy Award nominations, including Best Director, Screenplay, and Visual Effects. And he only won the award for Visual Effects, making that the only Oscar Kubrick would ever win in his career, which seems Weird given how legendary he is in Hollywood, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Not everyone gets their due. In the decades following its release, the film has become more popular and respected and likely better understood. The financial success of 2001 A Space Odyssey meant that MGM was just about ready to give Kubrick the world. For Stanley, this meant fulfilling a dream project he'd had basically since he started his career, a movie detailing the life of Napoleon. So Kubrick wrote the script, developed the idea, sent researchers to find locations across Europe, and devised detailed plans for the, the required battle scenes that would require hiring a literal army of extras, numbering some 30,000 people in total. And the movie never really came to fruition, meaning Spartacus was Kubrick's first and only epic. His Napoleon movie would have blown it out of the water, no doubt, but unfortunately it just wasn't meant to be. Despite having a script, a solid plan, a committed lead in Jack Nicholson, and the strong foundations for an incredible movie, MGM changed ownership, resulting in the filming shell due to the exorbitant nature of production being just too much for the studio to commit to. And no other studio jumped at the opportunity either, leaving Napoleon, the dream Kubrick, never got to fulfill. And it's one that Ridley Scott just came in and made for him. And I guess I have to mention my favorite story about production of that movie, where Ridley Scott brought a bunch of um, actual historians in to talk to him about Napoleon. And when they pointed out things in the movie that didn't happen the way they were being portrayed, um, his response was, were you there? And they're like, well, no, but historical records, like, were you there? No, okay, then shut the f up. And, <laughs> and that's why you have just scenes in that movie of just Napoleon just shooting cannons at the pyramids. <laughs> Guess why not? It looks cool. Yeah. 
If you were to pick Kubrick's strangest movie, you'd likely choose A Clockwork Orange, based on a 1962 novella by Anthony Burgess. Kubrick, who'd actually first read the book when filming Dr. Strangelove, initially rejected the idea of making it into a movie, but now, six years later, he decided to adapt the book himself for his first solo screenwriting credit. And one of Kubrick's main reasons for filming A Clockwork Orange was the new nature of Hollywood, which was more open to film, showcasing those things we all love so much, sex and violence. The film was made over the winter of 1970 to 1971, which was the same time that Kubrick and his family moved to the UK permanently. A Clockwork Orange cost around $2 million to make, but was released worldwide on January 1972, but was eventually pulled from the UK after the press put the blame for recent copycat crimes on Kubrick and the film's shoulders. And this dovetailed with something in the UK known as the Video Nasty Era. And if anyone's unfamiliar with the term, basically it was just this strange moral panic where just a lot of uber violent slasher movies and low budget horror movies like Cannibal Holocaust and things like that were being released on VHS and were being purported to be real and people were just working themselves up into a frenzy over them and they were being sold um, uh, in like back alley um, uh, video shops and shown in CD theatres and there were people who were literally arrested over selling or renting these tapes to um, uh, the public. It, it, got, it got real dire. It's a very embarrassing footnote in film history and one that as a British film student I had to learn about. And it's like, really? R really? They gave that much of a shit? It's like, yeah. Cool. So much for artistic expression, I suppose. But getting back to Kubrick, thanks to his contract with Warner Bros, which heavily favoured him, Kubrick was entitled to 40% of the profits the movie made. And Kubrick decided to capitalise upon this by creating a cinema database. Not only did this make Kubrick rich, but it gave him even more free reign on pretty much anything he made going forward. And this is a thing in Hollywood that they don't really let people do anymore because Movie studios realise that if you give actors or directors or producers points on the back end, it can usually result in a payday far exceeding um, even the most exorbitant like fee. Um, perhaps the most famous example is uh, the film Twins, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, um, where Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger and director Ivan Reitman all agreed to um, act in and direct the film respectively for free, waiving their usual like, you know, quite high fees, in return for, I think it was 25% for Arnold Schwarzenegger, like 22% for um, uh, Danny DeVito and like 20% for Ivan Reitman, of the film's profits, which, sure, and then the film went on to make $200 million at the box office. And that actually scared studios so much that when Arnold Schwarzenegger was negotiating his salary for Terminator 2 and he wanted a similar deal, um, the studio basically said, we will give you anything you want besides points on the back end. What do you want? What can we give you to not have you be, like get points on the back end of Terminator 2? And Arnold Schwarzenegger responded, $25 million on a jet. And they paid him $25 million and gave him a jet. Like, that's how scared studios were of like handing over like this amount of um, uh, earning potential to their stars. Napoleon may have been a long shot, but that didn't stop Kubrick from revisiting it periodically throughout the remainder of his career. However, the movie Barry Lyndon would be Kubrick's next film, and it was his best shot at making the historical film that he so desired. When it came to making the movie, Kubrick made artistic choices that had never been done before, which was a common practice for Kubrick's films at this point. He relied heavily on candlelight for lighting, staying true to the era, even obtaining a lens from NASA, which was to be used on the moon and retrofitted it to the camera. These choices did come with their own problems, somewhat understandably, like a lack of lighting causing the camera to be incapable of focusing properly. Still, Kubrick being Kubrick found numerous workarounds to ensure he got what he wanted, like literally just attaching another film camera to the overall camera to help it focus, a technique that would later be um, uh, expanded upon and pioneered in a way by B-movie auteur Tommy Wiseau. Oh, hi, Mark. What I mean by that is that Tommy Wiseau, when making his magnum opus, The Room, Room, literally filmed it twice using a film camera that was just bolted on to a digital camera. The reported reason why being that Tommy was so apparently bought a book on filmmaking because he didn't know what, what he was doing. Can you believe it, given the quality of the film? And when he read that most Hollywood productions are filmed on either digital or film cameras, couldn't decide which would be the right one, so bought both and bolted them together. The filming of Barry Lyndon lasted eight and a half agonising months from the spring of 1973 until early 1974. It was filmed primarily in Ireland and had a cast and crew of about 170 people. Premiering in December 1975, the film 
tanked. It was a, a huge commercial failure and the worst of Kubrick's career. And the film did manage to get nominated for seven Academy Awards, but it didn't make any money. So seven Academy Awards, no money. So while Kubrick did continue to work on other projects, the failure of the movie did weigh heavily on the director and sunk him into a deep depression. He obsessively attempts to change Barry Lyndon's financial failures throughout that time, like by making edits and changes and re-releases and all that kind of stuff, and it never really worked. He even went as far as to supply cinemas with the right equipment to show the film so that people could appreciate the effort he put in, but yeah, it didn't really work out for him, and the amount of control Kubrick had in his film sometimes came at his own expense. Kubrick's next film was The Shining and was born from his desire for a hit. So to find his next projects, he read numerous books, looking for something, anything to adapt, which is when he came across a little Stephen King novel called The Shining. Filming took place between May of 1978 and April of 1979 and remains Kubrick's most controversial shoot due to the treatment of actress Shelley Duvall. And most notably, the scene which featured her being attacked by Nicholson with an axe was reshot 127 times, another staple of Kubrick's career, because Kubrick felt that she wasn't representing a terrified woman terrifiedly enough. Shelley Duvall herself would later say that she really was terrified because a large man with an axe was really trying to get to her. Because another behind the scenes story about the making of this movie is that Jack Nicholson was in pretty good shape when they made that movie and was a f like a trained fire marshal so he knew his way around an axe and specifically knew how to chop through a wooden door and the story goes that when they brought in the prop door for Jack Nicholson to axe his way through he cut it to pieces in like four seconds and just like it was like paper to him so that's to bring in real doors and then Kubrick proceeded to make Jack Nicholson cut through over 150 real wooden doors so that when they finally got the shot of him like pushing his face through the hole he would be suitably and convincingly manic stressed and sweating uh, meanwhile the entire time he was yelling at Duval to um, basically reduce her to a point of um, uh, just complete hysterics and arguably it worked you can't really do that to actors anymore, for good reason. Yeah, also, I guess someone in the comments also mentioned that um, uh, Jack Nicholson's Here's Johnny line was ad lib by himself. And it was like someone from Johnny Carson's that like, he saw anything funny and he thought it'd be a really funny thing for like, you know, a deranged maniac to say. So another, actually, you know what, more, more the shining trivia. Um, the, the part where it's like, you know, he's typing like, uh, all work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. Supposedly, Kubrick made an extra or a member of the production crew just sit there and type that out over and over and over and over again. So when Shelley Duvall is flicking through the script, that's actually been typed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times by someone who just spent an entire evening just typing that phrase out over and over again because Kubrick wanted the prop to be real and he wanted like the actress to be able to you know flick through it to any page and see that it said yes. All work, no play, makes Jack a door boy. You might think, well, surely you could have just mechanised that. Kubrick wouldn't let you mechanise it. It had to be done by hand. Yeah. So, when it came time to release the movie, Warner Bros. went all out promoting it, hoping it would be a big hit and make them lots and lots of money. And considering the $20 million budget, yeah, they, they had a sizable investment in this movie and they wanted to get that money back. So released on May 23rd, 1980, The Shining made $30.9 million by the end of the year. So, you know, $10 million, which was, believe it or not, a lot of money back then for a movie to make. And the movie was hated by author Stephen King and had a mixed response from critics, but in later years is well regarded as a classic of the horror genre and perhaps one of the finest of Kubrick's entire career. <sighs> but in the seven years that followed The Shining, Kubrick would work on his film Full Metal Jacket, and the idea was born and built upon the book The Short Timers by Gustav Hasford about the Vietnam War. Kubrick would write the screenplay with Hasford and Michael Hare, the author of another Vietnam War book, Dispatchers. Filming a Full Metal Jacket it commenced on August 27th, 1985, and wrapped less than a year later in September of 1986. And some trivia about Full Metal Jacket now. We have to give big shout outs to uh, the late Ali Ermi. I hope that's how you pronounce his name, like the drill sergeant from that movie, who was a drill sergeant in real life before becoming an actor. And the way he got the role is by filming himself screaming obscenities at the top of his voice for 30 straight minutes as people threw tennis balls at him. And he sent that to Kubrick, who looked at that and went, put that man in my movie. That's, that's a man who needs to be in my movie. So Full Metal Jacket was released on June 1987 and managed to earn some $30 million in its first 50 days. And 
In a rarity for a Kubrick film, it only received one Academy Award nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay. But in typical Kubrick fashion, it didn't win any of the awards. So yeah, so at least he was used to that. The gap between Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut was about 13 years, and during that time Kubrick worked on numerous projects, including Artificial Intelligence and what would have been his 13th film, Aryan Papers, adapted from the novel Wartime Lies. The film came about this close to entering production in 1993, but Kubrick cancelled it after deeming it to be too similar to Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. Artificial Intelligence almost got made, but Kubrick wanted Spielberg to direct it, and he was too busy then, so... He couldn't, and he ended up filming Artificial Intelligence in 2001 in Kubrick's honour. And I guess a couple of facts about um, uh, Schindler's List. I'll dwell on it too much. It's a very everyday Robin Williams would call the, the cast and crew to cheer them up because they needed it. And Steven Spielberg reportedly couldn't sleep, so I think he edited Jurassic Park because he needed just something to do because he couldn't sleep. And then there's the quite, I guess, wholesome story about when John Williams was brought in to score the movie. And John Williams like saw an early cut and just looked at Spielberg and said, uh, you need a better composer, to which Spielberg reportedly responded, I know, but they're all dead. Kubrick eventually settled on making a film based on the German novella, which became Eyes Wide Shut. The film began on November 4th, 1996 in England and ended in June of 1998. Kubrick achieved the film's first cut and showed Warner Bros. executives and lead actors Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman the movie, even telling his closest colleague that he believed it to be his greatest ever film. A day after premiering the first cut, Kubrick passed away on March 7th, 1999, suffering a heart attack in his sleep at age 70. Gone was perhaps the greatest filmmaker of an entire generation, along with numerous unrealised projects we'll never see in Kubrick's intended vision. But because of his like vast legacy, the end was not the end for Kubrick, and we do have another section simply titled... You could probably quite accurately say that Kubrick's talent was never fully appreciated in his lifetime. Most of the love and adoration for his movies came years, if not decades, after they were released. In the decades since Stanley Kubrick's death, his legacy has remained one of pretty much just unparalleled excellence. Filmmakers of every calibre still refer to Kubrick's work as a filmmaker himself as some of the greatest influences on their own careers. And Stanley Kubrick made the movies he wanted to make, but he wanted the world to love them too. And the career of one of the world's best filmmakers was never really an easy one, but the talent and hunger for film existed in Kubrick from a very early age. And he never stopped chasing the next movie and the next best shot. Even if that next best shot was a hundred shots after he'd already done the first shot and I guess I can, it's not touched upon much in the original script, but I can talk about that because I think that's very infamous about Kubrick that he would always insist upon doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shots. And there are a couple of like filmmakers, uh, directors who are known for that. And one's David Fincher, who like, very famously insists upon like doing multiple shots for all of his things. There's uh, the Breaking Bad director, Vince Gilligan, who similarly insists upon doing like dozens, dozens, sometimes hundreds of shots. Um, uh, to get a scene exactly right, and uh, in my research, one of the things that always stuck out to me about these, like you know, these directors of these very specific, ooh, these directors of these very specific visions is some actors hate it, some actors begrudgingly respect it, and uh, obviously the actors who hate it hate it for a pretty obvious reason. It it kind of sucks to be forced to do hundreds and hundreds of takes, even though many of them. Have, also in this camp here, where they do understand why it needs to happen. For example, The Shining example, where Jack Nicholson's performance, like his performance is so good in that moment when he breaks through the door because he'd been made to do over a hundred takes. So he was, the, the, the mania he displays is genuine, as is the fear and the hysterics of Shelley Duvall. Like, likewise, other actors who've worked in similar projects, with David Fincher, for example, who, when they're asked, does he really make you do a hundred takes? So yeah. But I'll tell him this, he always used the last one. Right, the, the take that's in the film is the one that he shot last, because that's the one he wanted. And it's similar for Kubrick, and when people have asked, of like, people who work with him, like, did he really do 100 takes? Like, yes, he did, but he did use the last take, because that's the one that was best. And, you know, it took 100 takes to get that performance out of me, which I think shows in the film. And, yeah, I think that's kind of interesting, that, yeah, okay, you're going to make you do 100 takes, but you are, well, I'm going to get the best performance out of you. And I guess to end on, one final story about that happening that is altogether different but similarly interesting, at least to me, is for the Simpsons movie. Like a very dramatic departure from the work of Kubrick, but there is a moment in the Simpsons movie where Marge is talking to Homer over a videotape. 
And towards the end of this conversation, Marge just says to Homer, I'm done. I recorded this over, like this, and to show that I am, this was recorded over our wedding tape. And they reportedly made the actress for Marge do that take about 200 times because they wanted it to sound suitably defeated and just completely done with that moment. And just, yeah, sometimes that's what it takes to get the best performance out of an actor. But just don't do a William Friedkin and just like slap people. Sh that's not very good. But those are stories for another day. And you can see me talk about them and others on my channel, Fact Theme with Carl Smallwood. You can also follow more of the author's work at the social media links below. And yeah, if you are so inclined while you're down there, you can press the like button, leave a comment with feedback, suggestions, any other interesting tidbits about Kubrick films you may want to talk about. And subscribe for more content like this. And I do apologize. Uh, to the editors behind the scenes uh, if this one went on a bit long, but anything that's going to involve film is going to result in me going off on tangents because I goddamn love sharing film trivia. Cheers, everyone. Have the day you deserve.